Welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Welcome. If I could ask everyone to please grab your seats. Uh, I want to welcome you all back to this rich conversation that has been going on over the last day. And um, just to once more remind you that we have um, bathrooms, men's bathrooms here on the third floor, women's bathrooms on the second floor, and a coffee shop in the basement. Um, Also looking forward on our program today, we have a wonderful lunch that will be available um, from 12 to 1 that will be in the common room um, in which we'll have a conversation between John Wilson and um, Professor Elstein about Jean Elstein, the writer. Um, We have still um, for our regular participants about seven slots, um, so feel free to sign on up and we might be able to squeeze you in as well if, there's a, if we've filled up all the slots. So without further ado, I invite up Andrew DeCourt to introduce our next panel. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Andrew DeCourt, and I'm honored to be a doctoral student working with Professor Elstein here at the university. And it's a special joy to be here this morning examining and reflecting on her work. Some years ago when I was working in Ethiopia, I discovered a hole-in-the-wall restaurant called the Florentino, permanently lit with Christmas lights, which I would frequent at night after a long day. At the Florentino, I met an aged man named Zacharias who was fluent in six languages and had lived under three regimes in Ethiopia, under the Emperor Haile Selassie, under the communist Derg, and under the revolutionary Democrats who are still in power today. Though his eyes were almost always bloodshot with beer, Zacharias was a man with a deep sense of history in the human condition who would often quote Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King, and Mother Teresa as we talked late into the evening. One night at the Florentino, a young man with too much beer in him was causing trouble at the bar. Without hesitation, Zacharias stood to his feet, looked deep into the young man's eyes, and demanded, Who are you? With each emotional self-assertion from the man, Zacharias demanded, Who are you? Soon enough, the young man had nothing left to say and was silenced by his elder's arresting question. He walked away, and Zacharias' question loomed thick in the bar for those of us that remained. Perhaps harder than the question, who are you, however, is the question, who are we? And this is the searching question that pulses through so much of Professor Elstein's gritty work, not least in her book by this title. And I think what distinguishes Professor Elstein's question, who are we, is that her depth of reflection and grace of articulation does not lead us to silence and a parting of ways, but to the serious task of disagreement, the discipline of dialogue, and the gift of fellowship and the bond of hope. It is this question and this task that this distinguished panel is here to discuss this morning. So let me introduce them quickly. Our chair and respondent is Professor Melanie Barrett. Professor Barrett serves as associate professor in the Department of Christian Life at the University of St. Mary of the Lake. She earned a BA in political science from Northwestern University. She then earned her MA and her PhD here at the University of Chicago Divinity School. Having earned a licentiate in sacred theology with a thesis entitled The Viability of New Natural Law Theory, she is completing the doctorate in sacred theology, if I'm not mistaken from the University of Freiburg in Switzerland. Professor Barrett is the author of Love's Beauty at the Heart of the Christian Moral Life, Constructing the Ethics of von Balthasar. She is a former affiliate scholar at the Institute for American Values and present member of Cardinal George's Bioethics Committee at the Archdiocese of Chicago. Professor Melissa Rogers earned a BA from Baylor University where she graduated Phi Beta Kappa. She then earned a JD from the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Presently, Professor Rogers serves as director of the Center for Religion and Public Affairs at Wake Forest University Divinity School and serves as a non-resident senior fellow with the Brookings Institution. She also teaches courses on church-state relations and Christianity and public policy within the Divinity School there. Professor Rogers previously served as the executive director 
of the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life. Before that, she was General Counsel of the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty. Rogers has co-authored a book on religion and law for Baylor University Press entitled Religious Freedom and the Supreme Court. Now, Professor Robin Levin is Carrie McGuire University Professor of Ethics at Southern Methodist University and the Don S. Browning Research Fellow at the Center of Theological Inquiry. He has served as Dean of Perkins School of Theology from 1994 to 2002, and prior to that, he was the Dean of the Theological School of Drew University. His teaching career includes service as an instructor at Chandler School of Theology at Emory University and 13 years as a faculty member at the Divinity School of the University of Chicago. He is a graduate of Northwestern University and Harvard University. He's an ordained elder in the North Texas Conference of the United Methodist Church and has served as the president of the Society of Christian Ethics. He has many, many writings. Uh, among them are Christian Faith and Public Choices, the Social Ethics of Bart Brunner and Bonhoeffer and Reinhold Niebuhr and Christian Realism. Professor Levin's most recent work is an introduction to Christian ethics, goals, duties, and virtues. So with this distinguished panel before us, I will turn the floor to Professor Barrett. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, the panel this morning is dedicated to Professor Elstein's book, Who Are We? Critical Reflections and Hopeful Possibilities. However, in addition to discussing this book, we will also draw on themes from writings in her other books and articles as well. Uh, to begin with, Melissa Rogers will give a paper entitled How Not to Separate Church and State, and then Robin Lovin will follow with a paper entitled uh, who are we? Realist Reflections on Politics and Human Nature. And then for my response, because I did not have a copy of uh, Professor Levin's paper earlier, but only uh, Professor Rogers's paper, um, I will give a response to her paper entitled Religious Freedom, Striking the Right Balance Between Disestablishment and Free Exercise. And because I won't be commenting on Professor Levin's paper in my response, uh, we'll make sure we get to questions on his paper as well in our Q&A. So without further ado, Professor Rogers. Good morning. Thank you. It's a wonderful pleasure and honor to be here with all of you, and especially to be included in this conference that uh, lifts up the work of Jean Bethke Elstein. I have been privileged to know Jean and to work with her. I got to know her when I uh, started as executive director of the Pew Forum on, Pro on Religion and Public Life, uh, an entity that is based in Washington, D.C. And uh, as Eric Gregory and I were talking last night, uh, you know that wa as JFK said, Washington is that city that combines southern efficiency and northern charm. And uh, Jean and I got to experience that together. We also got to experience the wonderful opportunity to work on breaking legal and policy issues as they relate to religion and public life. I learned so much from Jean in that respect, and I think in addition to her great academic scholarship, we also celebrate in this conference her status as a public intellectual, one who made timely and informed contributions to debates on law and policy as they unfolded in Washington and beyond. So my talk this morning is in that spirit. Uh, it is to address some issues uh, that are in our current debate and in our newspapers that touch on religion's role in public life. And I will draw, as uh, Professor Barrett said, I will draw on Jean's writings uh, from across a number of years and topics that relate to religion's role in American public life. Well, long before many others cottoned to this way of thinking, Jean Bethke Elstein insisted that the First Amendment to the United States Constitution, as well as extra-legal notions of church-state separation, do not relegate religion to the private sphere, nor should they. She was right. These laws bar the state from promoting religion, but 
They also protect the right of non-governmental institutions and individuals to promote their faiths, both in private and in public life. As the United States Supreme Court has said, the First Amendment makes a crucial distinction between government speech endorsing religion, which the Establishment Clause forbids, and private speech endorsing religion, which the Free Speech and Free Exercise Clauses protect. Now notice, of course, that the term private is a legal term of art here. It doesn't, of course, mean speech in private, but rather speech that is attributable to non-governmental institutions and individuals. Well, and again, to refer to something Eric Gregory said yesterday, Professor Elstein has most often discussed these ideas in the context of religion's interaction with politics. In the year 2000, Elstein wrote, and let me quote, as all students of American religion know, separating church and state is one thing. Separation of religion and politics is something else altogether. Religion and politics flow back and forth in American civil society all the time, always have, always will. How could it be otherwise? Too much of the same public territory is claimed by each. Membership in a community, formation of responsible selves who have communal and not just self-serving ethos, public modes of expression and action, going to church isn't a secret activity after all, Creating and sustaining institutions that serve communities, schools, hospitals, soup kitchens, daycare centers, elder care centers, and on and on, unquote. While efforts to hermetically seal off religion from politics may have less traction today, some other initiatives to seal off religion from public life are gathering steam. For example, rules have been proposed or adopted that may, would make religious institutions ineligible for certain free exercise protections if their activities could be deemed public in any way. And a few governmental bodies have told congregations that unlike other community groups, they may not participate in equal access speech forums on government property. These cases, in my view, involve mistaken applications of the First Amendment or mistaken applications of anti-discrimination norms, or both. Laws and policies of this ilk tend to crowd faith out of our communities, common spaces, and conversations. Now let me pause for a moment and say, or confess, depending on your point of view, that I believe and support in the firm limits that the Establishment Clause have placed on government-backed religion. I believe that those limits are good for both church and state. The government does faith no favors, in my view, when it drafts prayers, selects particular scriptures from certain religious traditions for public posting, or deems teachers fit to lead their class in prayer simply because they are fit to teach math or science. So I support Supreme Court doctrine on these issues, as I said before, prohibiting the government from promoting or sponsoring religion. I would prefer that the government not meddle in faith. And I think the Supreme Court teachings on these issues are right. But at the same time, Prohibiting the government from backing religion uh, does not and should not prohibit religious institutions and individuals from backing their faith in public space. So I'm trying to draw that distinction between government-backed religion that I think is a poor idea and religious institutions and individuals promoting their faith in our shared public life, which I certainly support. And I do not uh, share the claim of some that prohibitions on the government backing religion are prohibitions on religion playing a role in public life. I want religious institutions and individuals to play that role of promoting religion in public life. But it's in part that I think that the Establishment Clause should uh, 
prohibit the government from promoting religion, that I think the state has to take great care to protect the religious expression of individuals and institutions in our public life. Otherwise, it may leave little space for religion to play a role and operate in our society. Indeed, given the fact that the government has grown exponentially since the time of the founding, increases the danger that the government could crowd out religious expression it is, if it is not attentive to the barriers that the Supreme Court has enunciated that I discussed a little earlier. Acting on blunt assumptions that the exercise of religion on government property must be prohibited or that faith-based organizations must choose between practicing their faith as they see fit or being able to act in any arena deemed public would reflect hostility to faith rather than the benevolent neutrality that the First Amendment insists that the government must show toward religion. So what I'd like to do with just the little bit of time that I have this morning is touch on a couple of examples of policies or proposed policies that, in my view, turn on misguided public-private distinctions. In other words, I'd like to offer, if you will, some examples of ways in which church and state should not be separated. And I'd like at the same time, however, to finish uh, that uh, description with a, another assertion that although we hear claims today that the government is waging a war on religion, I believe those claims are overblown. And I believe that they may keep us from properly identifying and addressing the concerns that I am going to discuss. Also, I maintain that the fact that there, that there are some inappropriate efforts to limit one's free exercise of religion certainly does not mean that the right to freely exercise one's faith is absolute or should be absolute. It properly is limited as well. Well, let me begin with a case decided by the United States Supreme Court uh, during its last term. It's known as Hosanna Tabor Evangelical Lutheran Church and School versus Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, or the EEOC as I'll call it. The Hosanna Tabor case involved a former teacher at a Lutheran elementary and secondary school in Michigan. Her name was Cheryl Parrish, and she was what the school called a, a called teacher, meaning she had a vocational call to the ministry, and she had completed a theological course of study and had been uh, selected by the congregation, indeed called by the congregation, to serve at the affiliated school. She taught fourth grade students in a range of subjects, including math, social studies, music, and religion. She also regularly led the students in prayer, worship services, and other devotional activities. She became ill in July 2004 and had to take a leave of absence and was eventually diagnosed with narcolepsy. Later that year, she became involved in a dispute with the school about her employment there and ultimately was dismissed by the congregation. She subsequently filed a complaint with the EEOC, and the EEOC took up her complaint um, that was based on the Americans with Disabilities Act. So she claimed she had been fired in a discriminatory fashion by this religious school. The EEOC, uh, at that time, under the George W. Bush administration, accepted her claim and litigated on her behalf from that time forward. The school, on, for its part, defended its decision, and it said, it defended its decision in the following way. It said Parrish was a minister, and that made her employment there different. It pointed to her theological training, her call from the congregation. It noted that while she did teach what some would view as secular subjects, that the school expected her to teach those subjects with an eye toward the background of the, the religious ethos of the school, and that she also conducted prayers and worship services for her students. So they said, we have traditionally what is called a ministerial exception in the law. The ministerial exception says that Religious communities have, must have the ability to make employment decisions regarding their ministers without any governmental interference. They have to be able to hire, fire, and discipline their ministers 
in the ways that they decide without being subject to any discrimination lawsuits or other oversight by the state. This idea called the ministerial exception has been recognized by the courts for decades. It's fairly well established, but had never been considered directly by the United States Supreme Court until this case. So the school said, yes, we did dismiss her. We had religious reasons for doing so. She's a minister. We're covered by the ministerial exception. The courts don't have a business in reviewing our decision. End of, end of the story. Well, uh, now, keep in mind, with the ministerial exception, doesn't apply to all employees of religious organizations, only ministerial employees, which is a smaller number of employees of religious organizations than you know, the janitor and, and the like. Uh, many other employees of religious organizations are not covered by this exception and can sue their employer for employment matters. Well, so this suit went up uh, with uh, Parrish claiming discrimination and the EEOC defending her and the church making its uh, defense, the trial court ruled in favor of the school, saying, you know, the ministerial exception applies to Parrish. She's a minister, and thus we cannot consider her discrimination claim. An appellate court reversed that finding and said that her suit could continue. But what they said is they didn't say there's no ministerial exception. They said Parrish is not a minister. They had a test for trying to determine whether she was a minister or not. They looked at her employment duties and said she's not a minister, so she can pursue her lawsuit. At this point, the Supreme Court was asked to hear the case, and they agreed. Also at this point, the Office of the Solicitor General uh, had to take on this suit because it is their duty to defend the EEOC before the Supreme Court. So it didn't... the. The Solicitor General's office didn't have a choice about which side to take in this matter, but they did have a choice about the kinds of arguments they advanced on behalf of Parrish. They, the uh, EEOC, uh, defended by the Solicitor General's office, did not simply argue that Parrish was not a minister and thus the ministerial exception did not apply. Instead, it surprised many of us by basically arguing that there was no such thing as the ministerial exception. The EEOC essentially claimed religious institutions have the same associational rights as other expressive societies, but nothing more. Well, this raised not only eyebrows among those of us who work on religion and law, but also many Supreme Court justices, it turned out. It was a very interesting oral argument that I attended. First, we had Justice Scalia deem this to be extraordinary, he said. Well, Justice Scalia says that a lot, so we had to take that with a grain of salt. But next, the Obama appointee, Justice Elena Kagan, the latest Obama appointee, started to engage with the government on this claim. And she asked them, does this mean that the free exercise and the establishment clause have nothing to say about a church's relationship with its own employees who are ministers? And the government, in many more words than this, essentially said, yes, it has nothing special to say. Justice Elena Kagan said that this was amazing, and not in a good way, I might add. <laughs> She said, she indicated very, uh, very strongly in both her comments and oral argument and her resulting opinion of the court that it was strange indeed to suggest that the Free Exercise and Establishment Clause, which address religion and only religion, wouldn't add something in terms of a protection for religious communities and institutions. Well, the EEOC uh, refined its argument um, as it related to the school, saying, and I'm quoting here, a ministerial exception applied to teachers in religious schools would be particularly unwarranted. That is because those employees perform a public function. Like teachers in public schools, they offer a service necessary to satisfy state compulsory laws. The EEOC added, one part of the recognized state interest in religious schools' secular functions is ensuring that they do not discriminate against their employees. 
So they were saying, the school is doing something that we deem to be public in nature, and that means that the school must then forfeit any special protections it would have under the free exercise clause, and thus we are able to intervene in this case, and there are no special protections for the church here in the form of the ministerial exception. Now, there were also lawyers participating on behalf of the dismissed teacher, and they echoed and even broadened these arguments, and I'll quote one thing they said. They said, religious organizations that extend their operations beyond worship and spreading the faith into the secular commercial realm must abide by neutral rules that apply to all such enterprises, including anti-discrimination laws. Now, think about these claims for a minute that they're making in their reach. These claims suggest that if an organization operates in the public sphere, broadly defined, I might add, is regulated by the government in any way, presumably, or provides a service that the government may see as a substitute for a service itself, it itself provides, then the organization forfeits its right to make unfettered decisions regarding the ministers that serve its community. And this right to make decisions regard, regarding ministers is, has been recognized for years as a key aspect of religious autonomy. Well, if this approach, the approach that the EEOC suggested should be taken, uh, if it, was a, it were to be embraced, it could mean, I think, that many congregations could not hire and fire their ministers without governmental oversight. Houses of worship, for example, often operate food pantries or feeding ministries that serve people without regard to their faith affiliation or lack thereof. These ministries are usually brought bound by some kind of self, uh, safety or health regulation at the very least, so they are regulated by the state to some degree. Does this mean that congregations don't have the rights to select their ministers or to fire them when they see fit? Certainly not, in my view. Religious communities should not have to withdraw from society in order to control their decision-making over their ministers. The Supreme Court, I'm happy to report in this case, uh, unanimously rejected the arguments of the EEOC, including Obama appointees, Justices Elena Kagan and Sonia Sotomayor. They ruled in favor of the Lutheran school and upheld the ministerial exception. Now, there are many more questions that need to be addressed in terms of the breadth of the ministerial exception and how it applies. But in this case, I was pleased to see that the court did reject the the wrongheaded uh, arguments about from the government that would have, I think, improperly required a religious institution to forfeit a key part of its autonomy simply because the government could define its functions in some public manner. A related problem arose, and I think I'll just discuss this one other example before turning the podium over. Uh, this is a related problem that many of you are familiar with, I think, of the United States Department of Health and Human Services and a decision it has made regarding preventative health services this year that relate to contraception and the what insurance policies have to cover in regard to contraception services for women. In January, uh, the Health and Human Services Department outlined these services that all new insurance plans are required to cover as a result of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act of 2010. The plans that are new health plans have to cover contraceptions and sterilizations, contraceptives, excuse me, and sterilizations, including drugs like Plan B and Ella, but not RU486. HHS at the same time provided a narrow exemption from this rule for what it called religious employers. And let me just list the prongs of that test that an employer must meet, and it must meet all of those prongs in order to be considered a religious employer. The first prong says that the employer has to have the inculcation of religious values as its purpose. The second prong says that has to primarily employ persons who share its religious tenets. And third, it says it has to primarily serve persons 
who share its religious tenets. The fourth prong requires that it meet certain narrow IRS requirements, which basically apply only to churches and other houses of worship. So, in effect, this exemption from the requirement that employers cover contraceptions and sterilization in their health plans, the, the exemption only applies to essentially churches and other houses of worship. Now, the problem becomes, of course, that Catholic, the Catholic tradition and certainly in some others, but mainly and most, uh, most uh, notably the Catholic tradition, objects to most forms of contraception and does not want to include them in their employee health plans. Well, Catholic churches under the religious employer exemption would probably not have to cover and include contraception and sterilization in their health plans, but Catholic hospitals, Catholic universities and colleges, Catholic schools, Catholic charities would under this original policy be required to include contraceptives and sterilizations in their health plans. So this, as you can, as you well know, has, has caused quite a dust up and we're fighting over it uh, even today. Um, let's look though very quickly at these four prongs to see why people have raised objections about the limitation. The objection is not simply that the uh, exemption is too narrow, although that's also true, um, but, but that the, uh, the way that the prongs are framed tends to be an arbitrary uh, kind of determination and one that might discourage religious institutions from playing a robust role in public life. The first prong, as you will remember, uh, says that uh, religious institutions are not eligible for the exemption unless they have as their purpose the inculcation of religious values. And this has been interpreted to mean that they are explicitly teaching religious values, and that is their singular purpose. Well, nowhere in federal law are organizations treated as more deserving of free exercise protections because they focus on inculcating religious teachings explicitly rather than carrying out these teachings, for example, with actions rather than words. And doing so, it seems to me, could involve the government in deciding religious issues, which is something the First Amendment forbids. Also, you'll remember the second prong says that religious organizations have to primarily employ persons who share their religious tenets. I think the government was making a, a good intentioned effort here to say that if you don't share the employer's objection uh, to contraception and sterilization because you're not Catholic, for example, we want to be able to ensure that you will get the contraception services. And I think that was a well-intentioned move, but the way that they framed it, I think, is problematic. Um, and that's because uh, this religious organizations have long enjoyed the freedom to make religion-based hiring decisions, whether those decisions are to primarily hire from their own flock or to have a diverse, a religiously diverse workforce. And it is troubling to me that uh, pressure would be placed by the government on these organizations to primarily hire members of their own faith. Um, this pressure uh, may spare some of the institutions that fit the four-part four definition from being responsible for contracting and providing projects to which they object, but I think that it is problematic in bringing pressure on organizations to staff in a certain way that the government thinks is appropriate. At the same time, let me add that I think it's appropriate and I certainly support the idea that women who work for objecting religious institutions should be able to receive this mandatory health benefit, but we shouldn't enlist objecting religious institutions in providing it. Instead, the government should provide it or another independent party that does not object. The third prong that is problematic from my perspective, and perhaps most fundamentally so, is that uh, many religious institutions require service to people of all faiths and none. So for the government to pressure religious institutions to turn inward 
and only serve people of their faith if they want to enjoy free exercise protections is a mistake, in my view, and will tend to coerce religion to be something that it was not taught to be as a theological matter. So I have concern about this exemption, and many of us uh, do. Um, at this point, the controversy uh, is at a, a different status point in that President Obama has responded to the objections and made some attempt to allow religiously affiliated entities who are not exempt from the requirement to also object and not provide or pay for uh, these contraceptive services if they do, in fact, have religious obje objections. But those, that accommodation that President Obama has promised has not yet been um, filled out in rulemaking, and there's controversy over whether that goes far enough. But I think what religious leaders are concerned about uh, in the main um, is that this exemption does not continue to be replicated in federal law because of the disincentives that it gives to the free exercise of religion, the ability to exercise faith as we see fit. There are other examples that perhaps we'll get to in some of the Q&A time, but right now I'd just like to wind up. I think that Professor Elstein has helped us to see uh, that religion has a robust role to play in public life, and the First Amendment supports that role. It doesn't prohibit it from playing that role. Indeed, uh, we might say that the First Amendment protects a visible and vocal role for religion in public life. What we have to be mindful of here is that in developing our public policies, we do not uh, craft policies that tend to act as disincentives to religion playing an authentic and robust and First Amendment protected role in our public life. Now that doesn't mean that when there are interests on the other side, for example, interests in employees and not being discriminated against, interests of women who work for religious employers um, who would object to providing certain services as a part of health plan, their interest in getting a federally mandated health benefit are unimportant. Quite to the contrary, in my view, those, view, those kinds of interests have to be considered and weighed against free exercise interest. There is a balance built into the free exercise clause, and properly so. Free exercise rights are not absolute. Um, but we need to think more creatively about how we honor the free exercise rights of religious institutions and individuals while also protecting competing interests of other people who might be harmed or burdened by the free exercise accommodations that the government grants. I think we can do better than this, uh, than some of the examples that I've discussed. And indeed, I think there's a good conversation right now going on in, with regard to the contraception mandate about how we might solve that problem in what you might call a win-win way, where the religious institutions don't to have to provide benefits to which they object, but the women who work for objecting religious employers are able to access those benefits uh, via independent means. So let me just quote, uh, end with a quote from Professor Alstein. She reminded us that it would be a mistake to try to make religion invisible in our public life. And let me uh, close with this quote. She said, we reject the notion that religion is exclusively a private matter relegated to the home and sacred meeting places of the faithful, primarily for two reasons. First, religious convictions of individuals cannot be severed from their daily lives. People of faith in business, law, medicine, education, and other sectors should not be required to divorce their faith from their professions. Second, many religious communities have a rich tradition of constructive social engagement, and our nation benefits from their work in such varied areas as social justice, civil rights, and ethics. The First Amendment's aim is to ensure that the government neither backs faith nor prohibits its free exercise, not to remove religion from public life. Thank you.
Well, I'm going to be uh, taking a slightly different perspective on the on the book. Uh, this morning, uh, in part because I didn't do a very good job of getting my uh, paper to my colleagues uh, before this uh, conference, and in part because I changed it again last night uh, <laughs> after some things that came up in, in the discussion uh, yesterday afternoon. So think of this as a brief and more vocational interlude between the serious discussions of policy that my colleagues are are carrying on, in which I want to further reflect on this uh, Who Are We, this uh, book that Gene has given us of uh, possibilities and uh, po hopeful, po critical reflections and hopeful possibilities in politics, uh, and also pick up on uh, some comments she made yesterday afternoon about the difference between our time and Reinhold Niebuhr's time and, uh, and the way that he was able to play a role in public life and this, the space that religion occupied in public life in his time uh, versus the, the changing way that that's working for us uh, today. So first to the book. Uh, I've never thought of Jean as a marketing person, but it, it, she might have had some market smarts <laughs> in choosing this title and subtitle. Who are we? Critical reflections and hopeful possibilities. It reminded me of a very good book that I picked up the other day, which bears the title Sex and Death, and, <laughs> <laughs> and then the subtitle An Introduction to the Philosophy of Biology. <laughs> uh, and uh, in, 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 in this case, what uh, Jean is, is leading us to see, I think, is the way that the question, who are we, is fascinating for us as a culture. It's, as it were, a sexy question for a narcissistic culture, because it's usually confused with the question, who am I, or who do I want to be? Uh, it seems to open up an unlimited field of possibilities uh, constrained only by our capacity to, to consume enough energy drinks to keep us awake long enough to uh, check out all the options. And it's a question that a media culture encourages uh, because we're a culture in which other people make their lives available to us uh, to provide models and we can decide who do we want to be. Who are we, who am I, then in a perverse way becomes what we talked about yesterday, the first question of politics, but not at all in the way that Gene wants it to be. Uh, it becomes the question uh, of who do you want me to be that our politicians <laughs> ask us in these four-year uh, cycles. And, uh, and, and in which uh, the ability to create a brand for oneself is often confused with genuine leadership. This aspect of contemporary politics, of course, is a very superficial way of raising the question, who are we? But it's very much in evidence in the, at the moment, as it is every four years as we go through the cycle. And it raises serious questions about the limits of politics. Because one kind of limit to politics is that you need a certain reservoir of intellectual and moral resources to pull the politics off. And in the case of modern constitutional democracies, that level of required intellectual and moral resources is actually very high. So that we can ask the question, who are we, as the first question of politics, partly by way of asking whether we have those intellectual and moral resources to ask that question in public. Gene suggested one test case for the question yesterday afternoon when she questioned whether our political culture today could support a Reinhold Niebuhr. 
why is there no Reinhold Niebuhr today? Well, one answer may well be, as Jean uh, suggested in the discussion, that our more pluralistic uh, political culture today has no place for a single voice like that who represents a kind of dominant uh, denominational Protestant uh, religious culture. And she thinks that's not necessarily a bad thing if those fairly smug assumptions of cultural proprietorship are no longer possible. We couldn't have a Reinhold Niebuhr today, then, because the job Reinhold Niebuhr did is harder today than it was in, uh, in the 1940s and 1950s, speaking in public with a voice that echoes widely shared religious assumptions is now a job that could at best only be done by a committee, not by uh, any one individual. And that's an important insight. But there is another way of asking that question about why we don't have a Reinhold Niebuhr today that is not quite so reassuring. And that's what I want to point to for a moment. We could also ask, could we understand, we today understand and understand Reinhold Niebuhr's answer to this question, who are we? I hope so, of course, having written two or three books on the subject. But the we I have in mind here is our culture collectively. The question I want to ask is whether, as a culture, we have the moral and intellectual resources to understand, talk about human nature, and whether we have any idea of why that talk might be important. Augustinian theology has an important answer to the who are we question. And what Reinhold Niebuhr did in his own time in the Gifford Lectures in 1939 and 1940 was to bring that Augustinian theology out of historical obscurity and put it in dialogue with the major options that were uh, available in the culture uh, of his time to make a case, a bold case, an apologetic case, that this Christian understanding of the nature and destiny of man was superior to all of the options that were available. The result was the book, The Nature and Destiny of Man, which we still read 75 years on, uh, after, or almost 75 years after those, those lectures were delivered. So obviously there was some resonance uh, at the time, and a resonance that's still important to us. It's pro that his Augustinian answer to the question, who are we, has provided good work for a lot of us over this last 75 years. But I fear that those of you who are closer to the beginning of your career than the end of it, and that's a lot of you folks who have participated so well in this conference over these two days, I fear that you will have to begin your work with the more basic task of arguing that the question about human nature the question, who are we, is an important question with which to begin the political task. One of those assumptions that Niebuhr could just make, you see, was that, that the question of human nature, uh, even if not everybody was going to suppose the Christian answer, the question of human nature was important especially when the account of human nature includes an account of human destiny, when politics becomes teleological in the way that I described it yesterday afternoon, people become nervous and they start wanting to limit the scope of the discussion. And that's very much what's involved, obviously, in these legal efforts to uh, squeeze religion out of public life or control its place in public life, but it's not just a problem of the courts and the law. A lot of us who work in religious ethics, especially on the boundaries of religion and politics, have spent a lot of energy 
and time and ink on the question of public reason and whether public reasons, whether religious reasons can fit within the boundaries of that kind of public reason. These are important discussions to Augustinian, Niborian theologians, but we may have been too narrowly focused on the question of the role of religion in public to see what's going on with the squeezing of this space in public discourse. We may have failed to notice in our preoccupation with what happens to religious discourse in public that all forms of teleological thinking are being squeezed out of the public sphere. This contrasts sharply with an aspirational element that has been an important part of the public debate through most of American history. It was long recognized that there was a national interest in certain values, democracy and individual rights especially, and it was recognized that those values have an important place in public argument. This historic conviction that some aspirations are central to our national identity and thus essential considerations in public debate seems to be giving way to an idea of public discourse in which security and affordability are the main considerations uh, that, that public argument can be about. Issues of social justice have been largely absent from recent debates about health care reform and immigration policy, just as criteria of just war and standards of international law have largely disappeared from debates about national security. So my concern here is not just that religion, religious ideas and religious institutions as such may be forced out of the public square, but that the, the public square or the public discourse or what's going to count as a public reason is increasingly, as a matter of fact, never mind John Rawls's theory about the matter, as a matter of fact, public reasons are increasingly being limited to arguments about na national security in a fairly straightforward sense and arguments about uh, economic sustainability. These developments have significant implications. If the dominant terms in which policy questions are discussed continue to be arguments about security and economic stability, those considerations, those two ideas, will for practical purposes become the criteria of public reason. And those who want to be taken seriously in the public forum will address issues in those terms, while the use of other sorts of arguments, whether they're religious or uh, based on the rule of law or uh, any other kind of aspirational argument will be seen as a kind of rhetorical flourish. After you've made your economic case, you can talk about rights and justice. This affects all moral claims. This is, I think, the crucial point. Not just those that might be put forward on specifically theological grounds. What's happening to our public discourse then points toward the privatization of all aspirational arguments, not just those that depend on theology. If security and stability are the criteria of public reason, then who we are ceases to be a public question. We're free to aspire to whatever we wish, but we shouldn't expect it to, that aspiration to make a difference in the public discussion. This narrowing of the range of public reason doesn't mean that people will stop thinking teleologically. At least I tried to make a case yesterday afternoon that you know, that's kind of hardwired into us. What the narrowing of public reason means is that people will only discuss what they think is good with people who already agree with them. So the narrowing of public reason 
does not open up the field of public discussion. I mean, this, this is the argument in, in the law, right, that if we, if we exclude these religious arguments, we open up a field for public discussion. But actually what's happening when you exclude these aspirational elements is you increase political polarization because people only talk about the good with other people that they think already agree with them. It encourages people to believe that their values are unimportant or even incomprehensible to their neighbors. So we start to believe that ideas about the human good need to be cultivated among like-minded people rather than debated in the public square. Like-minded people then encourage each other to vote and hope that those who think otherwise won't bother to do so. <laughs> In turn, the long election campaigns and the low rates of political participation in the U.S. encourage candidates to build their strategies on mobilizing the base, while those who, and, and therefore those who aspire to leadership in politics begin to define the extremes rather than the center. So the, the uh, exclusion of this kind of aspirational element from public discourse uh, becomes corrosive of the political process in general. Now, there are Christians who believe on theological grounds that ideas need, do need to be cultivated among groups of like-minded people. Or, as they would put it, Christian faith is sustained by the shared narrative of the Christian community. These Theologians are not surprised that their beliefs seem unimportant or unintelligible to a secular liberal audience. That's simply the price of theological integrity. So perhaps the future of the question, who are we, for those of you who are closer to the beginning of your careers than the end of them, is that the question, who are we, will become a more particularly theological question to be asked and answered among yourselves unapologetically, as Bill Plaker would have said, a discussion which others are welcome to listen in on, but you won't, you won't be too surprised if they find it uninteresting. That's one possibility. We just, we just accept this uh, narrowing of the scope of public reason, and we do theology within the Christian community. But there is, I think, another possibility. It was suggested, actually, in a distinction that Chuck Matthews made yesterday afternoon, if, if I understood him rightly. It's the idea that we should perhaps think of our theological task not as apologetic, but as pedagogic. Was that, that the word that you used? Uh, if we were to begin today, to rehearse the argument that Niebuhr made in Nature and Destiny, we'd have to start one step back before where Niebuhr started the argument. The starting point would not be the apologetic task of demonstrating that the Christian answer to the who are we question is superior to ancient and modern alternatives. That's the structure of Nature and Destiny, as I hope everybody who's been in Gene Elstein's classes will know. Uh, but, the, but the task with which we may have to begin in the future is to explain why the question is an important public question in the first place. Why we all have a stake in keeping the discussion about human goods and human nature going. I would add that for this new generation, one of the most important places where you will take up that pedagogic task is in the colleges and universities where most of us do our work. And I do not mean the pedagogic task that you have with the students in your classrooms, though that's, that's obviously important. I mean the task of raising that question with your colleagues and especially with your administrators about uh, the, the, the question of why these teleological questions, these questions about human nature, these who are we questions, are an important part of the mission and work of the university. The greatest challenge to the flourishing of American universities today, it seems to me, is the demand that they be productive and efficient. 
In a time of rising cost and limited resources, we keep asking universities and colleges to demonstrate more and more that on economic metrics, they're doing a good and useful job. Uh, uh, we, we, you know, talk about graduation rates, we talk about employment and earnings for those who do graduate, we talk about student to faculty ratios, we talk about a whole set of other metrics based on the business model of cost per unit of output and market value uh, uh, per unit of output. The response of the universities, especially the most successful ones, has been to adjust to these limits rather than to challenge them. And one of the challenges, again, that all of you who are seeking a career in higher education that's going to deal with the values that are traditionally part of the liberal arts is making the case for that, not to the wider society, but in the universities of which you are a part. My own institution, Southern Methodist University, marked its centennial this year with a 27-page illustrated community and economic impact report uh, that was distributed with the Sunday papers in, in Dallas last uh, spring to show how important the university had become over the last hundred years to the economic life of Dallas and the nation. And the keynote of that document, I hope, prepared by the development office and not by the business <laughs> school, the keynote of that document was return on investment. See how much we got back for those few thousand dollars and those few acres of land that were invested a hundred years ago uh, in the university. It occurred to me over breakfast that Sunday morning that this might be a good time to retire. <laughs> It also occurred to me that this uh, return on investment language is a good example of the shrinking of the scope of public reason. That if you're going to talk about a university uh, in public, why do we need a university and, we're going to, and, and we talk about it in, in why do we, how do we talk about that in public? We talk about it in economic terms, in terms of return on investment. And that's one reason why the next generation of theologians and ethicists is not going to be able to rely on public reason quite as comfortably as my generation has done. So we've, we've gone through a, a, a cycle, if you will, vocationally in, in this uh, field in, in which we simply assume the identity of the terms of the religious discussion of human nature with the field of public reason. Call that the, the uh, world of Reinhold Niebuhr, as Jean described it, to a point where we've uh, spent now a full generation arguing about whether it's possible or even important for theologians to recast their arguments in terms that were acceptable to public reason with the unapologetic uh, theologians insisting this is a really bad idea and we ought to give it up, you know, stay away from it in the interest of, the of theological integrity and others more like myself saying we have to take that public reason seriously and see how we, we can talk about these theological understandings of human nature in those public terms. But while I was doing that, I didn't so much notice until that unfortunate Sunday morning with the papers in Dallas that the field of public reason had been shrinking all around me. You know, I kept reading John Rawls and I thought there was a really good theory here about public reason uh, that I could live with and do my theology in that context. And what I didn't notice was public reason was uh, in, in actual practice was shrinking all the time. That's probably uh, an appropriate concern for the generation that is now uh, beginning to take up their careers in theological ethics. 
Howard Wass and I are both retiring this year, as a matter of fact, and perhaps those of you who are beginning careers doing the kind of reflection that we have done and that has occupied us here are going to need to do something different from either Howard Wass or Reinhold Niebuhr. As the list of goods available for public discussion shrinks, theological integrity requires attention to the proximate character of all human goods, as well as to their ultimate ordering to the divine good. In the political climate that now prevails, security and affordability seem to be the only proper objects of public discussion. Other human goods are private and particular. We are entering a period of austerity in public reason as well as in public expenditure. Mm -hmm. And it's hardly surprising that many people, can, uh, including many religious believers, conclude that politics is now no concern of theirs. The public forum simply can't accommodate the goods that are most important to them. That's politically dangerous. But it's also, I think, theologically untenable. It implies that human goods are not part of an ordered reality to which we are all related as part of God's creation. It implies that human goods are instead created by communities of like-minded people who define themselves and their goods in opposition to others who cannot share our goods because they are not us. To lure people who think in that way about the good back into arguments about a rich variety of temporal public goods is an act of witness to the unity of divine creation. It might be worth the risk, then, of some of our Christian distinctiveness to, uh, to preserve theological integrity on that point, on that witness to the unity of divine creation. At least, I hope, that some of you who are closer to the beginning of your careers than the end will find that a risk worth running. Thank you. This is a nice podium. I'm only five foot two, and uh, at the institution where I teach, the podium is about <laughs> up to here. And the other day, I uh, injured my knee, and the doctor said, you, "Well, you need to wear flat shoes for a couple of weeks." And I said, "I can't wear flat shoes. I won't be able to see over the podium." <laughs> so I'm wearing heels today, but I'm glad that the podium is not too high, regardless. <laughs> So the title of my paper is Religious Freedom Striking the Right Balance Between Disestablishment and Free Exercise. And I'm responding to the fuller version of uh, Professor Rogers' paper, so I may cite quotations that you haven't heard this morning, and that would be why. In her thoughtful and clearly articulated paper, How Not to Separate Church and State, Melissa Rogers commences her analysis by invoking Jean Bethke Elstein's oft-repeated assertion that the First Amendment's Establishment Clause, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, was never meant to relegate religion to the, public, to the private sphere. It is one thing to separate church and state by prohibiting governments from either establishing state churches or endorsing one religion at the expense of others. It is quite another thing to, quote, hermetically seal off religion from politics to use Roger's phrase, given that citizens participate in both institutions simultaneously. After all, the same set of personal beliefs that inform my decision to join either a church, temple, or mosque, or none of the above, also inform my understanding of the role of government. Do all human beings have rights, or just some of them? When either human or civil rights come into conflict, how should such conflicts be resolved? Is the role of government primarily to protect negative rights, like freedom of expression, or also to ensure positive rights, like the right to a living wage, basic health care, affordable housing, and universal access to education? Am I responsible only for myself and my family, or for my countrymen and women as well? What about immigrants who reside in my country illegally? What responsibilities do I have to those living outside of my country of residence? What duties, if any, do I have to non-rational creatures or to the ecosystem as a whole? 
These questions and more I address as a rational agent whose reasoning is always based on upon a particular set of metaphysical commitments, some of which I share exclusively with members of my own church, temple, or mosque, some of which I share with practitioners of other religions, and some that I share with non-religious believers. Moreover, the way that I reason from those core commitments to a set of practical conclusions in various situations can also result in disagreements with my fellow religious adherents. For example, we might both agree that Jesus is Lord and that the role of government should be limited in accord with the principle of subsidiarity, yet disagree, perhaps even radically, about how much money the government should spend on social welfare programs. To be rational is to be capable of reasoning not only from my deepest held beliefs, but also about them. My core beliefs are core precisely because I choose to subscribe to them with a strong level of commitment, but even those beliefs remain capable of being refined, modified, or even reversed, at least in principle, if compelling new evidence leads me to conclude that one or more of my foundational beliefs was in fact mistaken. Accordingly, I can choose to be a hippie in one decade and a free market capitalist in the next. I can focus my efforts on saving the whales one year and developing commercial real estate the following year. Less likely, but still possible, I could transition from atheism to Buddhism to Christianity and then back to atheism, all the while driven by a profound regard to seek the truth wherever it may be found. Of course, the exercise of reason does not occur in a vacuum, but within the context of a dominant culture of in which various authorities endeavor to elicit our support. Sometimes we relate to these authorities in a thoughtful way, carefully examining the veracity of their worldviews in order to assess their credibility. At other times, we are intellectually lazy and simply adopt others' beliefs in an uncritical way, as if by osmosis. This passivity on our part can occur not only when encountering institutionally established authorities like churches, schools, businesses, or governments, but also in the face of more covert authorities. Not only various news sources ranging from the New York Times on one end to maybe Fox News on the other, to internet blogs, to chat rooms on various topics, but also the entertainment industry, including fashion magazines, Hollywood movies, and TV sitcoms, as well as those individuals with whom we are closely acquainted and seek to emulate, co-workers, friends, or family members. The choice between passivity and rational engagement in the face of such influences is well described by Bruce Lincoln in his book, Authority, Construction, and Corrosion. He writes, quote, if authority involves the willingness of an audience to treat a given act of speech as credible because of its trust in a speaker, then under the sway of authority, an, an audience acts as if it had been persuaded, when in fact it has not, while accepting the fact that its regard for the speaker obviates the need for persuasion. In contrast, when authority is asked to explain itself and responds to that request by arguing in earnest rather than simply reasserting itself, it ceases to be authority for the moment and becomes an attempt at persuasion." Unquote. What does this need for rational engagement with authority imply for the participation of religious believers in politics? Both believers and non-believers reason within the context of a whole range of social authorities competing for their allegiance, some institutionalized and others more diffuse. The mere fact of institutionalization does not forestall rational argument. I could choose to relate to my church, temple, or mosque either passively or as a rational agent seeking to be persuaded. Mere membership in a religious institution does not transform me into an unthinking automaton. Indeed, Pope John Paul II explicitly called upon religious believers to reject fideism, arguing that, quote, rational knowledge and philosophical discourse are profoundly important for the understanding of faith, indeed for the very possibility of belief in God, unquote. Conversely, the absence of a religious commitment does not thereby immunize me from being brainwashed by more covert authorities. I might consciously reject religious affiliation in the name of freedom from authority, yet nevertheless choose in a completely unthinking way what clothes to buy, how much weight to lose, with whom to engage in sexual relations, whether a particular war is just, or which political party to support in the next election. It is the means by which we relate to a whole range of social influences, not the type of influence per se, that determines whether we enter the political realm as thoughtful participants or as unthinking marionettes unused to the rigorous demands of rational argumentation. Viewed in this way, 
Membership in a religious institution is not inherently antithetical to participation in the public square. If a religious believer is already accustomed to rationally weighing propositions rather than mindlessly internalizing them, then he or she will be well equipped to work with others toward advancing the common good. Moreover, although some adherents cite religious values to justify acts of intolerance and violence toward others, more frequently, at least in this country, religious practitioners learn values that authentically promote social progress. For example, that other human beings have dignity accorded to them by their creator and consequently have a right to those things required for their authentic fulfillment, and that we have a duty to help those who cannot help themselves, the poor and other vulnerable members of society. It is this potentially salutary effect of religion that led the framers of our Constitution to include in the First Amendment not only a clause prohibiting the establishment of a state religion, but also a clause providing for the free exercise of religion. Taken together, the two clauses strike a helpful balance between several competing goods. One, the deep-seated human need and therefore human right to seek the truth freely without being coerced by others. Two, the need to restrain any potentially damaging effects of religion, either A, when its beliefs or practices, though well-intentioned, are based on falsehoods, or worse, B, when some of its members misuse their power, controlling, manipulating, or even abusing others for the sake of vanity, personal gain, or a desire for domination. And three, religion's capacity for forming people in genuine humane values, like self-sacrifice, care for others, social justice, self-discipline, responsibility, personal freedom, the privileging of rational persuasion over coercion, the need to refrain from activities that harm others, such as lying, cheating, or stealing, compassion, forgiveness, and peace, to name just a few. Ideally, the two clauses of the First Amendment work together to balance all three of these competing goods. However, as all of us have witnessed at one time or another, this is often a delicate balance to strike, and this difficulty was well articulated by Rogers. Failure to exercise such care, she says, would reflect hostility to faith rather than the benevolent neutrality the First Amendment requires. As examples of such failures, she cites prohibitions of religious gatherings on school property at times when other social groups were allowed to gather. Also problematic, she maintains, would be forcing faith-based organizations to choose between practicing their faith as they see fit or being able to act in any arena deemed to be public. Such policies are wrong, she muses, because they are based on a misguided public-private distinction. Uh, She mentions the example of the evangelical Lutheran church and school um, and argues that the ministers should not be forced either to forfeit their rights to make unfettered decisions, uh, a key element of religious autonomy, or to entirely withdraw from society in order to retain such control. She applies a similar line of analysis to the recent HHS contraceptive mandate, which required health insurance plans to cover both contraceptives, including the controversial emergency contraceptives, Plan B and Ella, which has an abortifacient effect, and sterilizations under the auspices of the 2010 Patient Protection and Affordable Health Care Act. Although religious employers who objected on religious grounds were given an exemption, the category religious employer was defined in an extremely narrow way, as she mentioned. Uh, In response to public outcry, on the part of such institutions, the administration proposed a compromise whereby the responsibility for covering contraception would be shifted from objecting employers to their insurance companies. The compromise was ultimately deemed insufficient by many religious organizations who, along with some for-profit companies, have filed widespread lawsuits against the government. In her analysis of the case, Rogers initially sides with the outraged leaders, affirming that the exemption is too narrow and employs arbitrary criteria and language unprecedented in federal law. In the final analysis, however, she seems at times to side with the administration, implying that the Obama administration's current accommodation sufficiently respects the free exercise interests of most religious organizations. And I'd like to hear more about, uh, from her about this, maybe in the Q&A. Uh, Her justification for this position comes at the end of her paper when she offers the following principle, quote, when the government has compelling interests like public health or safety and it pursues those interests in ways that place only the lightest burden possible on the free exercise of faith, then even substantial burdens on religious exercise are justified, unquote. She further cites a 2005 Supreme Court decision that a government accommodation of a free exercise claim must be measured so that it does not override other significant interests. By balancing free exercise claims against compelling public interests, a careful balancing will take place, one that will, quote, not require religious organizations to surrender aspects of their free exercise rights simply because they have entered public life in some form or fashion, unquote. 
In my opinion, the balancing act that Rogers proposes is a good one, at least in principle. A government would be forfeiting its duty as protector of the common good if it did not take into account compelling interests like public health or safety. As Elstein contends in her book on sovereignty, governments are obliged to exercise such responsibility. However, as Elstein contends elsewhere in her book on Augustine and the Limits of Politics, governments must also be careful not to overreach. For we are sinful human beings whose God-given reason and capacity for love are coupled with a lust for dominance that cuts across all levels of human existence and all human institutions. Because earthly power is always tied to the temptations inherent in that form of power we call dominion, we must remain circumspect when exercising it. With Augustine, she says, any human institution can be turned into an idolatry, whether of family or of the state or of anything else, if it is driven to become superordinate rather than chastened or limited. How does this apply to the case at hand, the HHS contraceptive mandate in its current form? I would suggest that just as we need to be circumspect lest religions misuse their power in ways that harm others, either intentionally or unintentionally, so we need to be equally circumspect about other institutions, including the federal government. In the case at hand, the current regime believes that providing contraceptive services and elective sterilization for women is such an important public good on the level of public health and safety that it compels them to limit free exercise rights in order to provide it. The overarching goal, as Rogers points out, is to secure health benefits intended for women generally. In response, I would like to pose some questions. First, is this mandate a compelling women's health issue? At first glance, the answer seems to be yes. After all, it is important for women to have access to the means required to regulate the number of children they have. And if this access is important, then shouldn't women, especially poor women, have access to free birth control through their employer-provided health insurance programs? But then why all the lawsuits on the part of religious institutions? Is this just an instance of unthinking brainwashing trumping common sense? Does the Roman Catholic Church's participation in these lawsuits amount to a form of subterfuge, waving the flag of religious freedom as a cover for a more pernicious agenda, one in which men misuse their hierarchical positions as bishops to control, manipulate, and ultimately domin dominate women and their bodies? According to Maureen Dowd of the New York Times and many others, the answer is yes. In my estimation, however, the answer is actually no. A close examination of Catholic Church teaching on contraception and related women's health issues reveals that the Church's position is based on reasoned arguments stemming from a set of rational presuppositions about the nature of human beings and what constitutes human fulfillment. The overall framework is both logical and coherent, and it is one with which reasonable people, including non-Catholics, could agree, at least in principle. At least four points are salient in this regard, and I'm just going to summarize very briefly so I don't get too far off topic, but to give you a sense of why I think this is a reasonable reasonable claim. First, sexual intercourse is theorized under the heading of love, and love is understood not as mere sentiment of a transient nature, as in I love you tonight, but tomorrow, next week, next year, who knows, but as the lifelong commitment to the good of the other and to mutual growth and holiness. Marriage is thus a necessary, though not sufficient, condition for sex to be truly fulfilling. Second, within this context, the church is absolutely in favor of responsible parenthood. It teaches that married couples can limit the number of children for all kinds of reasons, including their, the couple's uh, physical or psychological health, the condition of their marriage, the overall good of their family, and their social and economic circumstances. The church takes issue only with the means used to attain this good end. Whereas contraception subverts the person's natural power of fertility by artificially rendering it impotent, natural family planning works with the nat natural cycles of fertility, which the church affirms as more conducive to human fulfillment. The abstinence portion of NFP also helps couples to develop the virtue of chastity, which improves the quality of their subsequent sex acts, learning how to act not merely on impulse, as do animals, but to treat each other in a way that is fully loving and wholly personal, rather than as mere objects for personal self-gratification. Uh, moreover, the science of natural family planning has greatly advanced since the 1960s when the rhythm method, also known as Vatican roulette, <laughs> was the form of periodic abstinence practiced. And for good reason, a lot of people got pregnant using that method. Thanks to cutting-edge research, both the symptothermal method taught at Creighton University and the symptohormonal method taught at Marquette have a 98 to 99 percent effective effectiveness rate, which is similar to both the birth control pill and condoms. Consequently, a couple who chooses to practice NFP rather than contracepting does not forfeit anything in terms of effectiveness. 
third, because uh, third, the church affirms that all human beings have dignity or value, not just some of them. Because human life begins at fertilization and continues to develop after implantation, contraceptives that, firm, that harm fertilized ova are considered abortifacients and are thus deemed particularly morally objectionable. For Catholic employers, subsidizing health insurance that funds abortifacients is a form of moral cooperation with evil, tantamount to giving someone money that might be used to get an abortion. Because children, even unborn children, are worthy of protection, Abortion is considered a form of murder, and requiring people to cooperate financially in what they believe to be the murder of children is no small thing. Fourth, the church's opposition to contraception does not automatically translate into a lack of support for women's health in general. Birth control pills are permitted by the church for therapeutic reasons, such as the need to regulate one cycle or to treat endometriosis. Moreover, this permission is not new. It was codified in paragraph 15 of the church's 1968 document, Humanae Vitae. Similarly, it is deemed morally permissible under the principle of double effect to remove a cancerous uterus while a woman is pregnant or a fallopian tube in the case of an ectopic pregnancy, despite the fact that the death of the fetus occurs indirectly as a result. Also, paragraph 36 of the U.S. Catholic Bishop's ERDs, their Religious and Ethical Directives for Catholic Health Care Services, explicitly permits Catholic hospitals to treat rape victims with medications that would prevent pregnancy so-called emergency contraceptives, as long as they can be reasonably certain that the patient is not already pregnant. The upshot of all of this is that it is possible both to protect women's health and to prevent unplanned pregnancies without a thoroughgoing commitment to free contraception, abortifacients, and sterilization, even for non-therapeutic reasons. The religious institutions suing the government cannot be written off as acting on the basis of mere religious reasons not amenable to rational discourse. Consequently, it is not self-evident that the HHS mandate constitutes a sufficiently weighty public interest to restrict free exercise claims. If the religious exemption were broadened, then those Americans who desired employer insurance subsidized contraception and sterilizations could simply choose to work for non-Catholic employers or to attend non-Catholic universities. It is also important to bear in mind that this is not an exclusively Catholic issue. As the U.S. bishops have pointed out in a recent fact sheet, which is available on their website, uh, many others have joined the Catholic bishops in speaking out against the mandate. Many recognize this as an assault on the broader principle of religious liberty, whether or not they agree with the church on the underlying moral question. For example, at a February 2012 congressional hearing on this issue, testimony supporting the bishop's position was heard from the president of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, a distinguished Orthodox rabbi, and officials and professors from several Protestant institutions of higher learning. The nation's largest Catholic denomination, the Southern Baptist Convention, has strongly criticized the contraceptive mandate, as have leaders of the National Association of Evangelicals, the Institutional Religious Freedom Alliance, Union of Orthodox Jewish Congregations of America, Evangelicals for Social Action, and the Council for Christian Colleges and University. An online declaration supporting the church's position has also been signed by about 28,000 Catholic and non-Catholic women, including many health professionals, academics, and businesswomen. So where does all this leave us? with the bigger question, namely, who gets to decide what counts as a compelling public health or safety issue, compelling enough to restrict free exercise claims? Does the government need to make a rational argument to defend its positions? Are these arguments amenable to public debate? Do all three branches of government need to concur? Should religious organizations have a chance to make their case as well? Can the government always be trusted to act in the public good, regardless of whether there are Democrats or Republicans or some combination of both in power? Or does it depend on who speaks for the government at any given time? I don't have an answer to the question of who gets to decide, but I worry about the lack of public debate. If an individual has a serious conscience-based disagreement with his or her church, temple, or mosque, he or she has the freedom to leave either the particular denomination or the religion as a whole. However, if an individual has a serious conscience-based disagreement with his or her government, he or she does not have the same freedom. Coercing individuals to act against their consciences by requiring them to pay for ethically objectionable services, even indirectly, is harmful not only to those individuals but arguably to the public good generally. As Rogers herself noted, when religions are forced to retreat from the public square, non-believers who benefited from their schools, hospitals, and social service work will forfeit important goods. But arguably, there is something even larger at stake here. By providing such a narrow exemption for religious employers, a liberal government ironically finds itself in the position of acting in a decidedly illiberal fashion. 
violating the right to religious freedom by forcing non-exempt religious employers to act against their consciences. Prudentially, this is a big problem because it places government on a dangerous path, that of establishing a secular religion. A state-established secular religion would be problematic for exactly the same reasons that a state-established theistic religion is problematic. It sets up society for conflict in the long run. And Professor Lovin alluded to this in his comments yesterday. For as history has taught us, when citizens in a pluralistic society are forced by their government to act against their most deeply held commitments, their most deeply held ethical commitments, violence tends to ensue. One of the most important rationales for disestablishment of state religion is to ensure peace. And here I draw on the work of the 20th century Jesuit theologian and political philosopher John Courtney Murray, who helped draft, this, draft the Second Vatican Council's 1965 Declaration on Religious Freedom, Dignitatis Humanae. In his 1960 book, We Hold These Truths, Catholic Reflections on the American Proposition, Murray included a chapter titled, Civil Unity and Religious Integrity, the Articles of Peace. There he argued the following. How are we to understand civil unity? as a unity of different communities divided among themselves and linked by public consensus. Civil society builds unity through dialogue and discussion, not through suppression and coercion. In Murray's words, quote, the pluralism remains as real as the unity, unquote. He explains, the United States is a good place to live in. Many have found it even a sort of secular sanctuary. But it is not the church, whether high, low, or broad. It is simply a civil community whose unity is purely political, consisting in agreement on the good of man at the level of performance without the necessity of agreement on ultimates. As regards important points of ultimate religious belief, the United States is pluralist." Unquote. Given this pluralism, the two articles of the First Amendment function as articles of peace. By permitting sufficient space for the free exercise of religion, the values and beliefs that divide us need not bring us to the brink of civil war. According to Murray, this is the precise context that the American founders had in mind. They, quote, were not radical theorists intent on constructing a society in accord with the a priori demands of a doctrinaire blueprint, but rather keen observers of what was actually given in history, unquote. Like all good lawmakers, they sought to preserve public peace under a set of particular conditions. They recognized that social peace is the highest integrating element of the common good, and that this peace can only be ensured by equal justice in dealing with possibly conflicting groups. They made the prudential ju judgment that privileging one worldview at the expense of others would be a form of injustice that would naturally inspire conflict among those who disagree. Are the social conditions today as ripe for conflict as they were in 1789? Would a government impose secular religion, even in incipient form, sow the seeds of rebellion? The cautious response can only be yes, for human nature has not dramatically changed in the past 223 years. As Elstein argues in her book, Who Are We? Critical Reflections and Hopeful Possibilities, we are fallen, we are fallen creatures who live out our human existence in the saculum, in the time between creation and the eschaton, and as such are not always pacific in our dealings with others. She cites various signs of the times that seem to bear out Dietrich Bonhoeffer's vision of a social milieu in which, quote, the beasts were always straining at their leashes, rattling their chains, and awaiting release upon a complacent and uncomprehending and perhaps even occasionally joyous world, and we are the beasts, unquote. In this context, even a seemingly innocuous government mandate stemming from a genuinely good intention to better the lives of women can ironically end up stirring discord and social unrest, forcing a comprehensive vision of how women's health ought to be construed on social groups who possess an alternate vision constitutes a small but nonetheless perilous step toward a state establishment of a secular religion. Government reliance on coercion rather than persuasion, even if done for a good reason, could very well threaten to unravel the delicate threads of our fragile civic order. Elschain reminds us of this truth in her essay on freedom of religion and the rule of law, and proposes an alternative solution, one in which we work out such differences from the bottom up rather than the top down. And I'll close with this quote. Quote, the dialectic of normative commitments should be primarily a dialectic of citizens, variously located through a culture of democratic argument, citizens engaging one another and sorting things out as often they will in a rather untidy, rough, and ready way. For it is likely to be true that an issue of 
uh, an, an issue of religious and political importance that could be worked out informally becomes far more intractable if one group or another brings a test case seeking a controlling precedent. In such a circumstances, the battle lines harden. The dialectic is frozen before it even begins to unfold. The best way to work this out is on the level of public deliberation and contestation rather than on the level of preemptive adjudication. Let a thousand arguments, dialogues, and debates bloom. The legal cases should be many fewer, unquote. And to that, we can surely add the occasions for civil unrest would be fewer as well. Thank you. And we have about uh, 20 minutes, I think, if, we're, if we can go till noon. Or... Yeah, we're going to go until noon up here, and then we'll funnel downstairs for lunch, and we'll be getting lunch about 12 10. So I'll field the questions, and as uh, we did yesterday, I'll take maybe two or three questions at a time, and then leave them up to the speakers to respond. So if you'd uh, like to get in the queue, just raise your hand, and I'll note you and Uh, so first here, and then here. I have a question for Professor Lovin. I'm, I have to admit, I'm baffled by your account of the shrinking of the public reason. And uh, you cited, for example, three issues, health care, immigration, and what's the third one? Um, the... the Loss of just four arguments. Just yeah, yeah, right. yeah. And and he said in framing that he said that such issues are uh, being discussed primarily uh, either in terms of national security or affordability. And I have to say my experience is totally different from the public forums at every level, ranging from the humbleness of Twitter <laughs> to magazines like the New Republic and the Nation to university press books that are stacked up in my office. All three of those issues that you describe, I see debated in a very vigorous way, in a way that appeals to uh, public reason. Now, that doesn't mean that the various participants in this debate are coming to any agreement. Mm -hmm. They're not. But uh, not only are they making that appeal, they often do so from, from my point of view problem in these debates is more often what I would call crude moralism, which is rushing to an appeal to something that's presumed to be a good that we all share, and then saying, how can these monsters, for instance, on immigration, how, how can anyone feel differently from what I feel about like immigration? Because the moral, the moral issues are so compelling. So I, I feel like we must just be talking about different things because we can't be seeing the same picture. Okay, if we can hold that and then second question. Yeah, I think we're very much in, in keeping with this. It seems to me that the general history of America is misunderstood. We imagine they all somehow derive from some uh, wise founders who put together a document that is perfectly consistent. In fact, it's a bunch of compromises that, that uh, you know, were arrived at uh, that included many things that some people didn't want. The Green Fish Law certainly was a noxious thing. Decisions among them. Is always a question how we how we try to come to terms with those with those issues, and I think that the deeper question, which I think is really crucial in this, points towards the 1950s, which was the single exception to this whole period of time. Right, it was a period of unparalleled economic prosperity and dominance for the American economy. It was a period of universal policy consensus at the beginning of the Cold War, in which we we didn't have to disagree about whether we thought communism was good thing or a bad thing. It was a period of, of Protestant hegemony, probably the last moment of Protestant hegemony when Catholic for second class citizens when when immigration was incredibly controlled, right? And we became a, a, a much more uniform society than we were before and we have been since. So it's not surprising to me that we can't reduplicate that period of that period of, of consensus. And if we look at what's happened to us today, with the development of the, of the internet and all the multiple forms of communication, we're no longer just a free television network, we have hundreds of television networks. Uh, it's, it, we, we, we're in a period very much like the period after the invention of the printed press when we saw the complete dispersal of you know, growth and multiplicity of religious groups and political groups across in Europe. I, I mean, so I think, you know, I think this is where Gene's work is very helpful. There are lots of questions and, and 
dangers and entities out there that we have to that we have to struggle with, and how to how to hold this whole thing together. This you know we're we're, we're the, all those teams now trying to hold the company back together. Yeah, we're not going to do that. We've got to learn how to live in an age of, of dispersion and conflict and, and contestation, and and that's the world I think that we live in. So I I'm, you know, I've wondered how. Well, let, let me give it a, a shot first. Um, I can, you know, as you say, it partly depends, well, not only on what one is seeing, but then how, how you interpret what you're seeing. Let me, let me offer an alternative read of, uh, of the, the piles of books and, and so forth, it, because here, here's, the, here's the deal. Crude moralism, as you describe it, which you know, it, or or even sophisticated moralism, may well be a symptom of this shrinking of public discourse that I'm describing. Right, because uh, as I say, one of the effects of that is not that people stop talking in moral terms, but they conduct these moral discussions only in groups of people that, who already agree with them. Uh, you know, so, so lots of things are going to look like crude moralism in that sense because they, they are intended to be persuasive only to people who already share the position. Uh, so, so, you know, I, I mean, I think we, we could have an ex extended discussion, right, precisely about, it does, it, you know, does what's going on in the country now reflect some kind of flourishing of public moral discourse or uh, the or, or the shrinking of it? I, I, I at least tried to make my phenomenological case uh, for for the shrinking. Uh, with with regard to Niebuhr, I, I, I mean, I, I, I agree with everything. Uh, that, that you just said about the changes uh, that have happened, and I, I may not have been quite clear enough, uh, but all I wanted to suggest by, by going back to that point that, that Gene, I think, quite properly, you know, uh, gave us as a, as a starting point for thinking about this historical trajectory yesterday. All I wanted to do is suggest that the, that the historical development is actually a step further along the line than, than we, uh, we might have thought. It, that, um, that in a sense, those of us who are toward the end of our careers now made those careers dealing with the, the pluralization and the globalization of public discourse that, that you describe. And those who begin this discussion about theology and the limits of politics, you know, looking forward to what it's going to be like over the next 30 or 40 years uh, today, are, are, are going to face a, a different set of questions precisely because of, of where we are now. I think their choice, uh, it, it, it now makes much more sense for them to adopt a, a more confessional stance toward this pluralistic public reality, although I hope that's not the stance that they will adopt. That's why I, I uh, pick up on what Chuck Matthews said yesterday about the pedagogical task that is there, that before we can talk apologetically about a Christian answer to the question of, of, of human nature, we're now going to have to explain why it's important to ask that question in the first place. I just wanted to add two things. I'm not sure if your question uh, pushed in this direction, but certainly I would view, um, as, as Melanie pointed out, a, a variety of rights being expressed through our Constitution that do butt up against one another from time to time and need to be resolved. So all of these questions... Uh, arise, um, and many free exercise questions arise, by asking what is due to the religious believer, and then 
what effect will that have on people outside the religious community? And I think we have to be attentive to both of those things, and I very much appreciate your question about the conflict that we have to live in. And that's for the public good, uh, that we balance those things. And then I just can't resist because we're talking about this. Uh, Robin said so well uh, how we are describing matters in crude ways that that only people who already agree will embrace. And I just keep thinking about on the contraception mandate how we our public conversation is a war on women or a war on religion. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And although it seems yeah. to me a great example of ways to describe what's happening in in a, a, a manner in which only people who already agree with you will be able to embrace. So I hope that we'll be able to do better than that conversation, which is a very poor way of framing it. In, in, in that respect, I think I should say to my two colleagues here that that the way you two have framed the issues is, by contrast, I think, an extraordinary example of what's possible in the way of, of public discourse. Because remember, we've been we've been saying all along that this public discussion about human goods has to be specific and focused and, and, and concrete. And what both of you are willing to do is say, the question here is whether the provision of a certain set of health care services is crucial to women's welfare. Uh, you know, And lo and behold, we can have a rational argument about that. We can't have a rational argument about whether we're at war against religion or against women. It just is is it going to work. Stop yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, two more questions to give Professor Matthews. Yeah, you first. So, yeah, I would like more of that conversation because I'm slightly less sanguine than Bob in what I heard from, from you. Um, uh, if I assure the that 
it's not special. Yeah. And that religion should not be right. special. Okay, there was one there's one more question on the floor. We'll take that and then we'll have a discussion. Okay. <laughs> um, I'll go backwards. Um, the institution versus the individual, that's a very hot area of debate right now. And there's some, including many legal scholars, who would argue that free exercise protections are appropriate for individuals and not institutions. Conscience protections are appropriate for individuals and not institutions. Um, that's a movement that's gathering steam. Um, let me just speak to the free exercise element of that real quickly. The free exercise element, I think, is very properly and, and has a deep history of protecting institutions as well as individuals. And Jean's spoken eloquently to this over the years about how institutions are where we form individuals and transmit values and build for the next generation. So it's important, I think, for if we think about what would it be like to live in a country without free exercise of protection for churches and houses of worship, it would just be, it would, it would be so much, we would really harm religious culture. It would be hostility, I think, to not recognize the free exercise rights of institutions. Uh, always recognizing that those, when we accommodate institutions, more people may be burdened by that um, than we if, if we just accommodate individuals. So then we have to turn around and think about those burdens and what do we do about them to try, if we can, and uh, to lift burdens on others outside the institutions that might be harmed by the institution. Um, your your other question about, I think, it, and I'm not a theologian and not a Catholic theologian, so I, I'm only going to tread lightly here, but you talked about how the argument has been made by Catholics that these reasons about contraception or their refusal to provide insurance that would include contraception should be accessible to others and, and be able to be embraced, not simply as a matter of religious thought that doesn't make sense to anybody else, but rather something that could be embraced, and yet they've lost that argument. And that has been one thing, one thread that's run through the contraception mandate that's been very difficult. I was at a conference last week, a bunch of Catholic theologians who were very upset with the church, I hope I'm characterizing this rightly, because they said when they make the argument in religious freedom terms, what they're basically saying is this doesn't translate and you can understand and just accept it that it makes sense to us and back off when their understanding of tradition is that it has to make sense to others outside the tradition. Now, I'm not entering into, that's, a, that's an argument I'm not entering into, but I just was interested in witnessing the back and forth. My position as a religious freedom advocate would be we protect it even if we don't understand it. Now, we protect it as a dissenting voice sometimes. Like in this case, the government has made a decision that a certain policy on health is good, and then it asks itself, okay, what does it do with dissenters? And I think it ought to accommodate dissenters while still being able and free to push the majority view and the consensus view of health that differs from that. I hope that's helpful a little bit. And back to benevolent neutrality. I'll be quicker this time. I'm sorry. Um, great question. We could spend all day. Um, but benevolent neutrality, I think one of the ways the court put it once was allowing religion to flourish without favor or interference from the government. And that's an interesting line to walk, right? Um, my own view, and you tag properly, my bag with anxiety, so we won't get started on that, um, but uh, too much, but is that when government does get involved in uh, 
choosing, selecting scriptures and writing prayers, it actually stands in the way of the flourishing of faith because then the government is defining my faith for me rather than letting me do it. Uh, So that's how I come at these questions. I do think that um, there are issues in our jurisprudence that don't quite make sense. They don't add up. We have government-paid chaplains offering prayers before Congress every day. Well, that doesn't quite fit with the rubric that I've described, right? But there, I think there's some times that the court has, has been willing to say, this is a long practice. To strip it out at this point would strike people as being hostile to faith, so we're not going to do it. Um, I, I could mention also the ministerial um, housing allowance. I'm not sure that's defensible, and it may indeed fall on the wrong side of the line through test cases that are coming up now. But that's a very long conversation. Um, and then I want to turn it back over to Melanie. But I do, I do share some of Chuck's concern about the sometimes apocalyptic rhetoric that has surrounded the contraception mandate debate, um, so especially when you look in, in some of the states exemptions like this and policies like this were implemented, and there wasn't a huge outcry at that time. Now, as a lawyer, I understand that there are things done in the states that I don't get too upset about until they become federal law, and then I really scream. So I I don't mean to say that that is um, some kind of smoking gun. I just mean that there, there are some reasons that I've heard expressed by Catholic theologians that this would not be offensive under their theology of prudential judgment that could be justified. Um, And I wonder about some of the very harsh and hostile rhetoric that's surrounded the question. Thank you. Uh, uh, Professor Elshane wants to comment as well. Do you want to take this first? I just wanted to add uh, another historic dimension to this that may help us to understand why, for so many, we seem to have fallen, you know, from a period of civic consensus um, to one of civic contestation and even dissensus, if there is such a word, uh, where um, we, we, we speak happily about multiculturalism, but it's often competing and hostile monoculturalisms uh, that we see. And it occurred to me, listening to all of you, and thank you for your papers, that uh, the period before World War II uh, was a period of uh, uh, civic uh, disarray in certain senses. There was hysteria about immigrants. Um, There were all sorts of committees formed to try to forge some kind of unity or get everyone in on a grand national project. Um, And it was really the war that brought an end to all of that and that integrated the sort of fragments of the body politic that were, as Woodrow Wilson said, um, hyphenated Americans and others. You know, we don't want these hyphenated Americans. Well, the hyphen dropped away in World War II, and that presaged, you know, the era we were talking about, which was the era when, uh, you know, when uh, Ronald Niebuhr could assume, as I said yesterday, a certain culture that no longer exists. Um, So I think we should never underestimate the role that that war has played in um, shaping who we think we are as a civic, as a people. And war nowadays is not going to do the job. It's not going to, it's not going to draw us together uh, the way World War II did. So there's, there's a kind of um, halcyon moment that people speak of, you know, when we were all as one. We, there was one overriding goal. And if we keep searching for that, we will be forlorn because it's just not going to happen. So how do you articulate some alternative, um, some way that we have enough in common so that we 
are glued together in a certain way. We can we have a polity, um, but there's tremendous space, you know, for people to uh, live out lives that are rather different from from one another. And I think that that the fact, and I'll stop with this, the fact that um, some of us, I'm sure I'm not the only one get so many invitations to participate in discussions on um, are we falling apart, uh, you know, what do we have to have in common, uh, how do we deal with difference, uh, this, is the, this is the great anxiety of the moment. And I appreciate it because I feel that anxiety myself. So, but it is, it is an interesting, interesting moment. And how we respond will be very much shaped by what our contrast model is to the moment that we're in. And if it's, and if it's that, that period of World War II and the decade after, then we're, we're always going to fall short and, and always be feeling this terrible anxiety that the country is on the verge of collapse. So. <laughs> And I'm guessing we're out of time here to continue yes. the conversation. So uh, thank you all, and I'll defer to Michael. Well, please join me again in thanking our panel here. We thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School.